Sick outs and school conditions leave everyone frustrated. Parents, teachers, administrators, and students. Detroit Public Schools Emergency Manager Darnell Early is here this morning to talk about how to get kids back in class. And Flint's contaminated water puts Michigan in the national spotlight, our roundtable on crisis management. Today is Sunday, January 24th, 2016, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. After a nearly overwhelming week of news, stories broke with such ferocity this week, I was tempted to pull out a stopwatch to time the intervals between them. But nothing seems to be extinguishing the fire beneath the Flint water crisis. In fact, it only seemed to intensify with now the EPA saying they're going to take over the lead testing in Michigan because the state isn't up to getting the job done. A hearing is now set for Capitol Hill on the matter, but the story was really told this week by the face of Sincere Smith. Now the face of the crisis, thanks to Time Magazine and what they termed as the poisoning of an American city. In a big American city just to the south of Flint, school children were again left in the educational cold while their teachers and administrators fought over the way forward for those children. We keep calling it a sick out, but it has become a kind of strike, no doubt. And like that Time Magazine cover, it too comes with visuals that are now pinging around the rest of the country. Would have been nice for the picture of the week to be President Obama hanging out in midtown Detroit wearing a Detroit made watch. But the resonating pictures for many were no doubt about mold in the schools and lead in the pipes. There is an art to managing a crisis. We're going to talk about that today. But first, the man managing one of those crises, a conversation with the emergency manager of Detroit Public Schools, Darnell Early, on Flashpoint. Well, Darnell Early doesn't have to work very hard to hear his name mentioned in the news or see it on social media right now. If it's not about his current position as emergency manager of Detroit Public Schools, it's about his last job as emergency manager of the city of Flint. This week, he had a struggle on his hands just trying to keep Detroit schools open after mass sick outs that pretty much shut down the district. Darnell Early is my guest this morning. Mr. Early, thank you very much for coming this morning. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I want to talk mostly about schools. I would be remiss, though, if I didn't ask you first about uh, the situation in Flint. And I'm curious about your reflections on what we've watched unfold here as the former uh, emergency manager of the city. Well, obviously, you know, there's a great deal of concern about not only what happened in Flint, but for the people in Flint. But beyond that, I'm not really at liberty to comment a whole lot about that situation. Uh, because of why? Uh, I mean, y y the, uh, the governor's released his emails. There seems mm -hmm. to be an effort toward transparency about what's happened there. Uh, you have no, no thoughts on the way things transpired? Well, I do, but uh, of course, as you know, there is litigation pending, and so yeah. that becomes very uh, critical for me in terms of what I say and, and what I don't say. Are you revisiting your own actions as emergency manager and, and uh, any, any regrets about the way that you carried out your, your job during then or is that not? Well, let me just say that if people examine the facts, they'll see exactly what happened and perhaps it'll take the place of some of all of the media um, uh, coverage and, and, and the concerns that a lot of it is, is not as factual as what actually happened. So I would just encourage people to you know, seek the facts on that issue. We're all trying to do that, which is in fact that's what I'm doing now by yeah. asking you. Yeah. Do you in your heart or mind, have you been able to figure out where, the, where the, the blame for what happened really lies? Well, I don't look at it in terms of blame. I look at it in terms of a public policy decision uh, with, that had some unintended consequences for a number of reasons. Uh, let me just say for the record that, uh, again, you know, there were four emergency managers in the city of Flint, and True. I came along uh, at a time when this project was already underway, and it fell to me to oversee the implementation of it. And I only say that simply because that is a fact, and I think more facts like that need to be, uh, need to be sought out instead of um, just you know, trying to find someone or something to blame for it. Well, are you going to bed at night with a clear conscience, or are you feeling that you were partly responsible there for what happened? From the standpoint of the way I feel about it, I feel, as I said, certainly uh, uh, my heart goes out to everyone you know, that has to endure any kind of uh, catastrophe, whatever the case might be. But again, I think the facts are going to bore that all out. As you know, there is a task force that's looking into that, and I just soon wait until those facts are out. If people who want to ask about it haven't checked those facts, I would suggest that they do. Well, there are a lot of people, uh, certainly in the social media world, who believe that because of your involvement in Flint, that it compromises your ability to lead now in Detroit schools. Do you see uh, it, it, that being an issue for you as coming out, uh, trying to? Uh, 
<coughs> I, I, I guess you, your entanglements are what they are in Flint, and now as emergency manager of a system that many people feel they can't point to any progress here either. Well, I can disagree with that, and I think there's a lot of people that will disagree with that as well. But listen, I'm not here to justify or to uh, agree or substantiate what other people think. I mean, as you know, with social media and other outlets, that's always going to be an item of debate and discussion. All I can say is at the end of the day that, you know, the facts will bear out exactly whose uh, involvement meant what and what resulted in what. Uh, but again, it was a good public policy decision that, uh, that had some unintended consequences for any number of reasons. And, you know, that's how I have couched it in terms of what happened and what I think about it. Uh, the, the emergency manager setup or system then that we're left with, I think some people would say you can point to some successes in the municipal world, obviously Flint residents would disagree with that right now, but that you really have a hard time pointing to success in the emergency manager system in any school system. We had an emergency manager <coughs> in Inkster once upon a time, now there is no Inkster school system. Uh, I, I, isn't there still something at the very heart of it that is difficult to defend about the state taking over a school system? Well, I think what's difficult is getting people on board and trying to be a part of the solution rather than being, uh, you know, argumentative and, and uh, in opposition to uh, the fact that the position is designed to come in and to, to, to assist in providing options to uh, some very deep-rooted and serious problems. Uh, you know, you wouldn't need an emergency manager if your school district wasn't $515 million in debt. Uh, well, so of course, those are the things. You must hear all the time that the school system had a surplus well, before, the, before the state took over, yeah. and now it's $500 million. Yeah, we debt. hear a lot of things. We hear a lot of things. But the facts will show that there are a number of reasons why the debt is there. Uh, it's very convenient to blame the emergency manager. It's very convenient to blame the governor and the state. But I think when people examine the facts, and if, if there's no other takeaway from my time with you this afternoon, I would encourage everyone to, to uh, in, engage in fact-finding before they engage in finger pointing. I think it's important to understand that, you know, and I've said it before, you know, if people are willing to work with us to get this work done, uh, the sooner we'll be able to get the support that we need to invest in what is already a restructured school district that will look more like a district that can survive in 2016 than one uh, from 1956. And I think that's very critical to the understanding of the bigger picture. You can't just point to the things that are the hot topics and say, this represents the entire landscape for what you're trying to do. There's been a lot of good work done through emergency managers. And without the state's intervention in that, uh, I dare say it would never have happened. The, the the system, situa let's move on to the situation with the sick outs in this past couple of weeks. Uh, is it fair to call them sick outs or are we watching a strike? Well, again, I, I believe that the teachers should be in the classrooms and for whatever reasons uh, they're not, uh, that deprives the child and his family of the convenience and the right to public education. And call it what you want, call it or, or try to justify it for what you want, it deprives the students of, of not only the education, but it deprives them of the nutrition that they need to grow and to develop. It also causes the district to waste resources it doesn't have. So if we want to talk about emergency managers and how they contribute to uh, the deficit or the debt or whatever the case might be, let's look at some of the things that are also part and parcel to that, which incidentally are illegal uh, to uh, stop work or what have you in certain professions. Teaching just happens to be one of those. The conditions in some of these schools you were aware of, uh, <laughs> but I think that this was an eye-opener for a lot of people. And in that sense, didn't this work a little bit in getting um, uh, the citizenry a little bit more on the teacher's side, they're looking at these pictures saying, my kids couldn't learn in that, in that environment either. Well, let's talk about those pictures for a moment. Some of those pictures that you've shown and some of them that I've seen have been of buildings where those conditions were remediated, but were given to the media as part of a, a plan to, you know, to really underscore this point. I'm not in any way suggesting that our schools are in the best possible condition that they could be. What I am saying is that in cases where those issues have been brought to our attention, there have been plans that have been implemented to address those. So it's not like we're sitting back and knowingly uh, operating in situations where uh, health and safety are threatened. I think it's a little bit disingenuous to show pictures of things that we've remediated and some of them have come back because we've had to delay our maintenance program. The walkthrough because that our Paula funds. Tutman took at Spain Elementary, though, was uh, that, that was that was hours old when she brought it back to the mm -hmm. station. I mean, those were uh, those conditions. I want to let the teachers weigh in. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, let them have their say. Here are what we heard from some of the mm -hmm. teachers this past week. I got my math supplies last week. Okay, and of course, school started in September. 
So do the math. My oh, daughters oh. have school supplies. My students do not. My daughters have curriculum that works for them. My students have a social studies curriculum from 1994. <laughs> 1994 yeah. is our social studies book. We are not just a group of rogue teachers. We are not just a, a group of wildcat teachers or whatever we've been called. We are teachers, period, who teach in Detroit and love our kids. Yes. And because of that, we are disrespected and we are tired. I wholeheartedly believe that if Detroit wasn't predominantly African American and predominantly poor, that the situations and the funding and the emergency manager situation would never have taken place. Uh, in fact, Hillary Clinton tweeted out the same sort of thing about Flint uh, this past week, and I think a lot of people see some similarities here, uh, that, that this is, in the end, it ends up being about poverty and race, and we allow things to happen in those communities where we would in other, other places. Your, your answer to that would be what? Well, my answer to that would be, first of all, this is America. And people are entitled to their opinions. And I respect everyone's opinions about how things come to be and why they are. I don't agree with them. As you see, the issues that they brought up had nothing to do with the buildings. But that's just emblematic of the many issues that a distressed community like mm -hmm. Detroit, Detroit mm -hmm. Public Schools, has to deal with. And somehow that's lost in the rhetoric of let's show the worst and say that that represents everything. And it doesn't represent everything. We're able to provide a good learning and educational experience for our students. Do we have challenges, financial and otherwise? Absolutely. But thus, that's a part of the emergency manager role to come in and do what you can to change that and turn that district around. And for the last year, we've been working to do just that. The issue regarding materials and learning materials, you know, those are all things that can be fixed. Those are all things that can be managed, and we are in the process of doing that. Uh, the issue with the buildings, uh, people need to examine the facts, and they will know that part of what the governor is proposing for, before the legislature is to uh, invest a couple hundred million dollars for startup for a new Detroit public school. In fact, that's one place where I think that your, your interests uh, intersect with the teacher's interests, too, and that is getting this debt retired, mm -hmm. which is what the governor's plan uh, and are, are is there any place where we can see agreement where <laughs> these conditions may actually, the, 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 the pictures of these conditions may actually help your case in Lansing as they come to understand what's going on in Detroit schools? Well, to the extent that anybody is willing to help for whatever reason, we certainly welcome that. Yeah. Uh, but let me just say, you don't help the students by depriving them of days in class. I mean, irrespective of what the motivations are, the concerns are, and they're legitimate. I have, you know, I have the most... Uh, uh, a sympathetic feeling for a district that is in economic distress, for a city that is in economic distress. But, uh, you know, you don't make a situation better or solve a situation by creating a problem on the other end. We're here, the people you interviewed, myself and others, only because of the children. I mean, we're in the business of educating children. You can't educate children if you're walking a picket line. Uh, obviously, this is headed for a courtroom tomorrow. We'll uh, see what happens as far as these work stoppages go. But, uh, Darna Early, I think anybody would be foolish not to wish you the best of luck as you uh, move forward with what you're trying to do. Thank you. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you for being here. We come back. We'll bring in the roundtable. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. All right, let's dig into the week that was now with our roundtable. First, editorial page editor of the Detroit Free Press, Stephen Henderson. Next to him, Democratic Congresswoman Debbie Dingell back with us. The deputy editorial page editor of the Detroit News, Ingrid Jocks, is here. And the head of the Detroit Regional Chamber and a member of that advisory committee on uh, education in Detroit, Sandy Berua. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, let, let's start. We'll, we'll work our way back to Flint eventually, but let me start with the schools. Uh, Stephen, there, there really is this moment maybe where uh, both sides need to see that money is what is, going to, is what is needed here to fix a lot of problems. They're both arguing over the same thing in different ways, but retiring that debt is still the biggest piece of it, isn't it? Well, you've got to retire the debt, but you've also got to set the system up to be able to survive on its own after that. And I think there's some real questions about that. Do we have enough kids uh, in, the, in the system to draw that, that uh, allocation, um, mm -hmm. per pupil allocation, to support the, the number of schools that we have, the number of teachers? Uh, this is a system that has been crippled uh, over a long period of time and we haven't really talked about the macro issue of how do you fund a school system like this of this size and this magnitude in a city that's mm -hmm. losing population. Uh, 
I don't know what the answer is, but that's, I think that's the question. Ingrid, how compromised is uh, the governor now trying to get the school package? All anybody can talk about uh, in other parts of the, of, of the state and the country is Flint. Sure. Uh, and you've got the same guy, as I asked Darnell earlier, who's sort of connected to both problems. This is mm -hmm. getting to be a tougher and tougher ask, isn't it? It, it is. I mean, the timing is not good. The uh, DPS issue is one the governor has been working on addressing for almost a year now. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, there's growing um, you know, unrest in the district among the teachers, obviously. Uh, it's a little ironic that the teachers are, you know, they, they, they say they're doing these strikes, they're strikes. Uh, which are illegal in Michigan, they're doing them to raise awareness of the conditions in the schools, which they, that, that, that's it, a very valid, con it's sense, a valid concern. It? It's a valid concern, but at the same time, the governor has been pushing the issue because he realizes the school, uh, the district needs help with paying off its significant debt. And until that's done, a lot of the money per pupil funding for the, the students is going to paying off past debt and not to their education. So we really need this legislation that's been introduced now in Lansing to move forward. Sandy, same, same point. I mean, aren't they, they're both really arguing over the same thing in a way. Absolutely. So first of all, let's give the governor credit. He's tackled huge Detroit issues and for a Republican governor to do that, I think is absolutely fantastic. But you've got to dig into the numbers. When you look at DPS's per pupil allocation, it looks really generous. It's about $14,000 per student, which is one of the mm -hmm. highest in the nation. However, when you take out debt, which is $1,200 off the head of each one of the DPS students, wow. and then when you take off the amount of money mm -hmm. DPS loses on special education, the average allocation to the student that's available for each student is less than $7,000, or roughly $7,000 per student. Mm -hmm. That is insufficient to maintain buildings, as we're clearly seeing. It's insufficient to get the best teachers. It's insufficient for the students, especially in an underserved area. Debbie, we've got, there's an old saying about it takes uh, years to build a reputation and five minutes to destroy one. We've went suddenly from all of these articles that were going all over uh, the world about what a cool city Detroit is, where all the artistic people want to be, what a great restaurant city it is, and now the pictures that are going everywhere are lead in the pipes and flint and uh, these conditions in Detroit schools. Well, it's going to take time to build out again. It's not helping our reputation. I, I have no idea of, I'm sure he is a good man, but I'm not going to take cheap political shots because right now we need to be focused on the people of Flint. But the Are you emergency, about the governor? No, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm not. To, uh, correct. <laughs> uh, it, there's no way he's going to be effective in the job that he had in the current situation, and he should not make the governor have to. People need to know when they can be a success in a job that they had, and he cannot succeed given these current circumstances. I, I agree. I agree. And he should just resign and take the pressure off of everybody. Uh, I because, certainly give no indication of that. Uh, the car show has been a total and great success. People mm -hmm. came in and. Unfortunately, this all happened at the same time the car show did happen. You have an auto industry succeeding, and people see that with these other stories. And we've got to focus on fixing Flint and fixing the Detroit public school system and all coming together and moving forward. Uh, both of these issues get to the fundamentals, the things that we've ignored for decades uh, in southeast Michigan. In Flint, it's infrastructure, right? Uh, ultimately, it's the lead pipes leading to people's houses that mm -hmm. are the problem. Mm -hmm. in, in Detroit, it's education. If you think of how we've treated these things uh, in this community for that, that period of time, it is not a surprise uh, that we are where we are. And that has nothing to do, frankly, with the, uh, the excitement about the things that are, that are getting better in the city. Uh, we've been saying for a long time, that's all great, but there are sort of underlying issues, the poverty in these communities, uh, the lack of investment uh, over time. If we don't address those things, it's not going to matter uh, what we're doing in, in downtown. To Stephen and, and Debbie's point, just real quickly, you know, as the Economic <coughs> Development Organization for the region, I can tell you the interest in Detroit still remains incredibly high. The amount of capital mm -hmm. that is circling not just Detroit, but the region is, is still very, very high. And we can't let it go backwards. We absolutely right. can't, which is why we've right. got to work together. I was going to say, not the, take the, these issues have not moving. so far, we have not seen an impact with these issues yet. so far yet. 
perhaps but there yeah, is, but there's also a justice question, right? right. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, the, the people in Flint deserve clean water because that's uh, a human right. In this country people does. deserve an education in Detroit because uh, that's an American right. And I think uh, the economic issues are important, uh, and we've got to grow the economy and have people interested. But we've also got to make sure that the people who live but, here. But they're related, are not, especially yeah. in Flint, right? Because I, I, I mean, for those who are using the Flint issue as a political football, and people are using it that, you know, someone, if someone very famous said we should put red tape around the city of Flint. That does not help the good people of Flint and the economic developers in Flint maintain their businesses, maintain their property values, and attract businesses there. The, the, the infrastructure thing is one issue, but there's an also an element here in the narrative, Ingrid, of incompetence, that we bungled our way through to this mm -hmm. to the point where on Thursday last week we had the EPA saying we're going to take over the testing because you can't handle that either. Well, even though the EPA did its share of, of bungling, of bungling. Also, sure. So. Uh, I don't think anyone comes out of this looking that good, but just I just wanted to backtrack briefly with the connection between Flint and DPS because there is a strong one, and uh, I think one of the clear links is the current emergency manager, Darnell Early. And the governor has continued to support him and say that uh, Mr. Early didn't have any of the additional information about what was going on with Flint water than the governor did, but at the same time, he was the visible presence in Flint when this happened, and now he's at DPS where there's poor conditions uh, being shown every day in schools. And I think the governor needs to stand up and just tell uh, Mr. Early he needs to, to go. I think that it's time to make this call. You know, I, don't want, I think governor's got a lot of pressure on him right now. I do think we need to talk about why it's Flint and Detroit and where the gap keeps getting bigger because between those that have and those at the poverty level. Tell you what, let me take a quick break. I'll let you start with that and we continue. This is Flashpoint. I'm looking forward to be right back. Welcome back. Congresswoman, let me let you pick up with where you left off. There is, I, I talked about it last week on Flashpoint, this idea of low expectations, and we bend to meet low expectations. And that that's what many people say. That's why this was allowed to happen in Flint. That's why it's allowed to happen in Detroit, because we don't, something in our consciousness at the government level, at the, wherever you want to say it, uh, allows us to let things happen like that in poorer cities, minority cities, again and again. Well, first of all, government failed at the federal, state, and local level. At all levels of government, they failed the people of Flint. And it's hard we to argue cannot otherwise. let that happen with the Detroit public school system, so everybody has a responsibility. But there is a problem in this country that poor people do not have a political voice. And they were not listened to, they were ignored. It's what's happening in the Detroit public school system here, and we cannot allow this to continue. It's a tough one to get around, isn't it? It is, and I mean, something I can't help but think about is in, in Detroit and seeing these um, sick outs in recent days, weeks, um, with teachers. It, it, I, I don't understand why parents aren't coming out also, and, and they, they must be aware of the conditions in the schools. And I mean, this should have been Would talked about listen? for parents for years. Parents in Flint tried to have their voices heard, and they were ignored. Parents have banged their head against the wall and think nobody cares. And we have a responsibility uh, to a show people. Just a few seconds left. You believe Darnell Early ought to step down as well? I, I think the, the burden for a resignation is can you do your job and can you uh, prosecute what you're supposed to do effectively? I don't think you can. Tell you what, we got a lot more to talk about. So we're going to move over to clickondetroit.com to continue this conversation. I hope you make the move with us there as well. Here on the broadcast side, it's Meet the Press next, right after Mitch Albums, Heart of Detroit. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next time on Flashpoint.